the reference I was going to make was to that phrase. Have you ever heard of it? The good fences make good neighbors. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and without putting you on the spot too much, like, what is your interpretation of that? So that's actually a cliche phrase I used to use a lot, especially when I moved to Georgia, because um, um, that's definitely something I heard out west in Arizona. Good fences make good neighbors, and that was kind of shocking to me when I moved here that a lot of houses don't even have fences around their property here, like in the suburbs where we live. We had to build our fence after the fact. The previous owners didn't have a fence. Um, so I think it's a good thing. Boundaries, right? It's just basically setting boundaries. Although in this current political climate that we're in today and everything happening on the southern border, I don't feel as comfortable saying that anymore because <laughs> I think it's can be taken to extreme or it could be, you know, used as a counter argument because I, I don't think our border, uh, what's going on down there is, uh, it's the right thing to do was essentially building a giant fence along the Southern border. Um, but you know, I'm also internally saying like, well, if I so pithily say good fences make good neighbors and why, why am I against it down there? Right. It's a, it just gets, it gets complicated. Well, you've fallen perfectly into my trap here. <laughs> <You're pretty. laughs> yes. So because uh, the Great. the phrase comes from Robert Frost's poem, Mending Fences. And oh. the phrase is completely been twisted on its head. So have sure. you ever heard the phrase, blood is thicker than water? Yes, of course. And that similarly has been twisted. So... The original context of the poem was, or the phrase was, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the the water of familiarity, basically. Like, it, he was the actual phrase was saying, like, you know, the bonds we make from friendship are more important than family, but people twisted it to be the opposite. Oh. And similarly, oh. with the uh, fences, the whole point of the poem is that in, like, you know, the life of a neighborhood, the relationship you build with your neighbor is by working on the fence together. Mm -hmm. That's the mending the fences. Like the, mm. it's not, it's working together with your neighbor, not building a boundary. Boundary. Okay. Well, I was thinking too, not so much building a boundary. I guess that's the way I perceive it too, is like, because you both agree, there has to be an agreement that that is the fence that you share between you two and allows you to have some privacy, but at the same a fence isn't a giant impermeable wall, right? A fence does allow, like usually it's about a height where you can, you can kind of look over it or, or just, you know, just a simple little step or block to look over it. Um, it's not, it's not impermeable, right? It just kind of defines that line that's mutually agreed upon. So to that point as well. Yeah. It's amazing how many cliches and things get twisted around from where their original intent was. Right. The other big one was uh, money is the root of all evil. Uh -huh. The original phrase was the love of money is the root of all evil. Ah. And so it completely changes like the responsibility. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, the one that, that I hear a lot, that's on my mind a lot, is the jack of all trades is also used kind of with a negative connotation to it because I definitely describe myself as a jack of all trades and I'm I'm, I'm pretty happy with that, even with the negative connotation. But I think the – I don't remember the original line, but it, it was definitely more – are you familiar with that? Along the lines of better to be a jack of all trades than a master of none or something like right, that? Or, right, Like, yeah, because, like, it, it wasn't, like, either or. It was, like, that yeah. that you would have the opportunity to enrich yourself in as many ways as possible. Yeah, right. I get that. Well, Absolutely. that's going to fit in – to our theme today, because I'm going to welcome you to episode 40. This is a little bit of a milestone. Uh, I'd say a big milestone. Number <laughs> yeah. 40. Celebrate that. Yeah. So uh, sure. in lieu of a regular episode, we're going to try this thing out where we're going to do a sort of recap review of our previous episodes. And since like um, you've been the co-host for like the last 11, um, I figured we could kind of do a little retrospective here. So, um, That's good. I was thinking, you know, I'll kind of like read off the headline and then, uh, if, if there's something that you kind of like wanted to react to, go for it. And if not, we can kind of like move along to the next one. Okay. So, um, all of okay. my 
incredible uh, documenting is going to pay off now. <laughs> yeah, that's, this is the test. <laughs> so uh, number 29 was Nathan W. Pyle and Pizza Bach Paintings. That was on a January 16th. Um, and so our, our links were about um, just his comics, and then I had links to some of my paintings, and uh, we also had uh, a topic of fake newspaper headlines. That's a little fuzzy even now to me, but um, anything... Yeah, I don't remember that. Anything jumping out to you? Um, no, I think the Nathan Pyle thing, right? Uh, Nathan W. Pyle, webcomic. Um, I really like... I'm a fan of Nathan Pyle. I, one thing that struck me, I think, is we were talking uh, last month, Sean, was you mentioned that 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 I didn't seem very passionate about some of these things that I bring up, right? Like Nathan W. Pyle, like I like him. Uh, but then I think you might ask me some questions to go deeper if I was going to follow him more by his book or whatever. I'm like, eh, I don't think so. But that that's not to negate the fact that that uh, I, I do feel like he's just a positive influence on my life and in my my daily life of seeing him come up on my feed is always enhanced. By, by seeing his comic and a lot of other web comics too. It's not just him. He's just kind of the tip of the iceberg, but uh, it's, I don't know. I think as an engineer, which I definitely trained as an engineer and half of me is that like, we're just not super passionate people in general right? <laughs> or it gets ground out of you in school and some of that experience. I don't know what it is, but, um, but, but Nathan Pyle, he's actually, moved on to doing some new work, which is like these uh, alien uh, themed cartoons or from another planet, which I don't actually quite like as much because I guess they're aliens and they're sort of a little bit of uh, the humanities a little bit lost. And then I thought he did such a good job capturing it. I think he's still capturing it kind of the absurdity of some of the, the human life, but now it's with these little alien figures that, that I think make it more absurd that way. So it's cool to see him. It is, it is nice. One of the things I really like about this modern era we're in is you're able to see people um, grow and um, and change over time, just like you described with Zoe Milk and the artist that you follow last week, right? And I think Nathan Pyle for me is kind of one of those people that I'm seeing grow and change uh, over time, and he's moving in a direction I don't particularly um, like that much. Um, but I still see his comics. I actually saw my wife posted one of his comics on her Facebook page to share it, which I don't think is something she had done previously. So yeah, that, that's so a, that's good. That's a huge part for me. Like we kind of um, had aspirational goals of saying like it'd be kind of cool to document things as they're changing, and Absolutely. that you kind of capture that because like yeah. um, Nathan Powell obviously had success before, but like you said, like I've seen my sister post the alien stuff, and like it, it's like catching fire with a new audience now. Uh huh. So, like, that's kind of interesting that I got to have like a relationship with his work before seeing the the right. alien stuff. So, yeah, you know, and it's also a reminder too sometimes where I try to do caution myself with like actors, for instance, mm -hmm. that like if you see them in something and then you kind of form a, an opinion like this guy is this kind of guy, and then you don't want to give them credit or like you don't want to have any more patience for like checking out their other stuff, but really. Mm -hmm. It could just be amount of like when you when you met them and what they happen to be doing, right? A good yeah, example. they're definitely on a continuum. Yeah, right. And a, a good example for me was uh, Owen Wilson. Are you familiar with that actor? Yeah, totally. So, so when he first came out, he was like in Jackie Chan movies, and he had like this like surfer guy kind of vibe. He was in Jackie Chan movies. Yeah, he was like in Which Sh one? Shanghai Nights and Shanghai Noon. <laughs> It, and they were pushing uh, him. That was like that yeah. was the Western crossover, yeah, right? Okay, so All they, right. they were pushing him almost like as a kind of clown kind of character. Yeah, absolutely. And I had no idea that like he had co-written the Royal Tannenbaums with Wes Anderson, and like that he was mm. that cerebral, if you want to call it that. Like sure. I thought he was just a performer, and so I really had to like check myself because I had wrecked myself <laughs> in thinking he was like just a, like a goofy, like, sidekick kind of guy. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it, like, it's cool that I was already kind of, like, a pile fan based off of your suggestion, and then I already had something formed by the time, like, his more popular alien stuff is now kind of blowing up again. Is it? So you're seeing it? 
you're described as popular and blowing up, blowing yeah. up popularly. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, I wish him the best. Honestly, uh, that's good for him. Um, that's very cool. So um, that was good. Yeah. So let's check in with uh, number true. number thirty, where I talked about Bartolomeo Esteban Murillo, and you first brought up climbing handboards. Oh, is that the first time I brought it up? Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, gosh, let me look at the what were the, some of the show notes on that? Um, well, just to put it in the time frame, we also talked about the Super Bowl naming myth because that was right before the Super oh. Bowl came out. We talked about the NPR's Jason Rezanian in the Iranian prison over oh, avocados. Right. And the climbing. Yeah, I know. So, the, I mean, the one thing I will say about this episode was, and this is one thing I really enjoy about doing the podcast with you, is it just completely introduced me to Mario, which is just, I don't know if I would have ever come across him. I don't know. Who, who knows, right? But that was just really cool and insightful. Uh, 15th century old, way back. Right. And then you having not just say, hey, here's a cool artist, but some of the insight of the way he uh, the way he changed and influenced art, uh, breaking away from whether the church or the the royal family or whatever. Right. The the more elite uh, patronism patronage that artists sought back then versus painting in the street. It's pretty cool. And then on the flip side, what I remember was that the, the the first kind of conversation was almost more about the branding, so that like you had come up with like artisan climbing as a as like a title mm-hmm. for your company, and um, you at that point hadn't made that many hangboards. Like it was mostly an idea at the prototypes, that, right? Compared yeah. To now, yeah, absolutely. I think um, I don't remember if this was the one where I talked about getting motivated to to make one for the uh, the climbing competition, right? Or did I talk about that later? I think it might have been in this one. Um, but, yeah, I don't think I would have made that hangboard for that event if it wasn't, you know, your influence, your suggestions, in combination with my son as well. So kind of seeing a couple people uh, encouraging me in that way w- was pretty cool and pretty timely. Right? I really appreciate that. <laughs> so um, awesome. I'm going to – move on to the next one number 31 ramon valdez and what's in your bag yeah so uh ramon artful was his instagram account um we we uh, touched on a project that i think maybe has kind of been put on the back burner the laser cutting of a southwest scene that is completely on the back burner (laughs) yeah that was exciting for about two weeks (laughs) Uh we also talked about like the super bowl recovery project at the super bowl and then mm -hmm. and uh you fixed the maker station stools. Yeah, that was pretty <laughs> mundane, I think. No, I think there's two two good ones here. Yeah. Oh, and then you talked about go ahead. What, and yeah, and mine was in what's bag, in your right? bag, my like uh, yeah. thesis project. Yeah. Yeah, I want to talk about that, but I think first I think, you know, the laser cutting of Southwest scene was a very exciting sort of concept that fizzled pretty fast, which I think is probably common among creative people, right? You just you can't do everything that comes that you want that you get ambitious about. Might do this someday, but um but just don't have time to pursue it and don't have a pull for it. Um and then recycling at the Super Bowl I think is another one that's kind of a flop, kind of a disappointing flop, right? I mean I think even looking through my email threads, I had even volunteered I might go down today right, to pick some, some of that material up, and I honestly just feel not motivated to do that Yeah, anymore. for sure. Yeah. Just lost it, right? I think it was a, a combination of very ad hoc things happening, and they didn't seem to be able to handle having multiple people to, um, to interact with within org, which is really a, a kind of a disappointment to me. More than that, um, I believe Mike – because he's never let me down otherwise to say that he did submit paperwork and then didn't oh, get yeah. a response. So like, I, I believe it's on them. <laughs> like It is. Yeah. I see it completely. Like I think the NFL is doing something admirable. They're, they're trying, but they're, it's really not a priority for them from what I could see from my perspective, which I hate to say. Right. I mean, they, they definitely to give them credit, organize the event, worked with local communities and, and definitely saved a lot of material from going into the, um, into the landfill. Like no, no doubt about that from what, 
from what I could see, but, but they're obviously not funding it very well. These guys are very scrappy in what they're doing. And they, from my perspective, it just seemed like they didn't seem capable or maybe they've gotten burned. So they just refused to have two or three contacts from a single organization, right? They, they always insisted on one contact. And as we did handoffs between you, me and Mike, based on which of us was available, I think that was screwing up their, their contact list, right? I think they, they got a response from Mike, but they didn't have Mike on that day when he submitted it associated with the maker station. They had you or me, who knows, right? One of us. And they just ignored it, unfortunately, which to me in this day, when it's so easy to add people to an email or a list, that just is not acceptable, right? And that, that to me is a sign that they're not. Organizationally, they just don't take it that seriously. They could, they could hire hire an extra admin, right, to help with that kind of stuff. It's going to be pennies compared to the amount they're spending on everything. From a broader perspective, touching on both of those things, the NFL and the Southwest scene, um, I was thinking of the metaphor of um, if you've ever downloaded multiple files before and, you, and they were big enough that you would see, like, the progress bars concurrently – uh-huh. And then it'll have, like, in your browser, you have the option you could, like, X out of them or you can just let them kind of be going or you can suspend them, right? Uh-huh. Um, and I was kind of thinking, you know, it's more productive to think about your projects as being, like, suspend, don't X out of them. <laughs> like, yeah. that it's, like, the the laser cut thing, it's not like, oh, boy, that was a failure. I, no, I didn't yeah. stick with it. It's more like, you know, if something comes up that that fits better... I'll, yep. I'll I'll make it a priority, but it's not a priority on its own for me to force it. Right. And I do that with my paintings all the time, which is like I'll start a painting and then get to a level of like completion and then I'll put it aside and I, I purposely try not to decide, okay, I'm done because, you know, I I want to be able to perfect or improve and um like just the mentality of like get a project going finish it okay it's done like completing it isn't the victory right it's like especially with art that's a a broader thing that it's like Mm. it's kind of never done or that you know just getting numbers isn't the the finish line it's like success and how you however you define success right so like Mm -hmm. if you found someone who wanted to purchase a Southwest scene that would make it, you would give, that would define it, its own success, but just like, just doing it because you started it isn't necessarily the most productive use of time. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Which I think is why it's on the, it's off the back burner now. It's just sort of sitting there as a, a filed away. For, for sure. One difference that's kind of come up in the way we do this, um, going back to this now is thinking like I've been kind of curious if you've had any what's in your bags that you would want to bring up in the future like past projects maybe even past projects before you oh. you got into like the level of sure. competence that you have now absolutely I have to I'll have to I got <laughs> notebooks and idea lists and all kinds of stuff I'd have to thumb through that a little bit I mean for a while a few years ago I was creating an idea list um, that I never actually went back and reviewed anything that was on the list, right? It was only strictly add items to it and never look back sort of thing, um, which which I'm always curious, interesting to be like, I should go back there and look at that thing. Um, but I don't have time right now. I, I really, dude, I don't, honestly, I just don't have the time. Um, so stretched thin I, on purpose. I stretch myself thin. It's kind of how I operate. Um, so it's something that I have to come up with like, a real big forcing function that suddenly a lot of time becomes available to me, whether, whether I lose my job or some kind of injury, right. Or something happens, God forbid to, to my family where I have to take time off to, to care for them. And there's a lot of downtime associated with it. Um, but right now it's just barely, um, I have some, I'm actually taking this week off for spring break. And today I'm, I'm taking the day off before we go on a trip. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of work for my day job this afternoon, which is not good, but, uh, but I have some downtime now and I was thinking like, oh, I should crank out a hangboard, uh, just to make one. And I'm, 
I'm actually trying not to do that right now. Just not, not force myself to do that. Um, at the same time, last night I was going to work on the, the painting project thing for the make May the 4th event. And, um, I did it. I just, I kind of set it up, thought about it a lot, but I didn't actually take ink or not ink, but paint to the piece or, or do anything productive with it other than set it up in my garage. <laughs> well, the funny thing is it's like, so it's kind of going to take a little bit of a breather. Yeah. And I think you could also mm-hmm. count that as a win because I was there when you like cut the hang or the oh, um, yeah. board and you, but just like that amount of effort is a, a fine amount to have put in, you know, for like a day, if, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, let myself down that I didn't finish it or no. something. Right. Yeah. I was actually, my back kind of hurt last <laughs> night too. And I was like, God, how long were we down there? I guess it's about three, four hours. Uh, and then I did do a tiny bit of yard work when I got home. Uh, for about an hour unloading the car. I was like, God, I'm already dirty. Let me go trim this thing over here. It's some shrubbery. Um, so after all that, I was like physically tired. And I was like, yeah, I don't need to push it. Uh, I really appreciate the help though, because getting it, getting the spoil board off of that CNC was a major task that was preventing me from starting. Right. So now I've got that hurdle behind me. Um, and it was, I'm never quite sure. I mean, not, I don't know what it looked like to you, but I, I totally winged it yesterday as we like that was figuring it out on the fly. Like, how are we going to get this off and how are we going to cut it? And, I, you know, which tool are we going to use? <laughs> that was all very much on the fly. This is kind of a good metaphor for the way the show has gone. But like we tend to get interested in talking about everything but our topics. So like I was wondering if Ramon Valdez, if there's anything he's like so- come up with you since then. So not so – a little bit, just a little bit. So I haven't been following him as closely. The Instagram algorithms tweak what you actually see. So maybe he hasn't been naturally showing up on my wall quite as much. But he did finally release his marketery course, which is what I originally want to talk about. I don't know if I talk too much about that marketery work he's doing, but it's like a wood inlay kind of work that I had seen him doing. So he's released a course. Um, I didn't look into the course very deeply, but – that marquetry technique is very much related to the laser cutting of a Southwest scene, right? So that those two are tied together very closely in a kind of a strange way. Um, and I, I'm excited to see him like release a course or kind of pursuing his work as well and kind of growing the work that he's doing. So that's exciting. But yeah, beyond that, it's just watching it from a distance. Right. Well, like I'll do a little bit of update too. So like I brought up the what's your bag thing. Mm -hmm. And um, when I did that project at the time, I thought of it as like a kind of one off, like maybe even like I was being a little (laughs) self-indulgent and maybe Mm -hmm. and maybe I was. But like now I that's like primarily what I do is paint portraits. So like um, it it was like a digital birth because like it was digital photography. And and now like I I kind of feel like my f- drawing skills have caught up to like the goal or it's like getting yeah. there. <laughs> so like that I guess artists Ooh. who define themselves as artists kind of think that poetically maybe that they're like sure. they think of it as like that thing I started like I craft this narrative that it's like it's all a part of one coherent story when really it's a million stabs in the dark that in retrospect <laughs> you can kind of form you piece together. Yeah. Yeah. So, Hey, looking at, I did want to talk about the, what's in your bag because um, looking at your old portfolio website, the pictures are pretty cool, I think. And there is an element to me like, I could see this being some kind of like advertising campaign for like expensive handbags, right? Like, like the only expensive handbag I know of is coach brand because that's what my wife likes and things to think are awesome. But I know there's other brands out there and this seems like something that could be picked up on by something like that. Right. And I'm curious if that's ever, is that anything that's ever come up as an idea or, or so like, being approached by anybody that want to do something like that more hmm. as a commercial work? Yeah, like, I guess um, that I could kind of get sidetracked, but basically, like, out of school, I was very scared of just failing completely. Mm -hmm. So I was working in design, 
Mm-hmm. And um, this was actually kind of ties into what we talked about or should have talked about last week about lazy artists, which was that um, one tool to like not just be the stereotypical lazy artist bohemian type that works as a barista is that you get into a competitive art- artistic field. So mm-hmm. I was doing graphic design for um, – a sports company like to do like football teams and you know the cool. Braves and all this sort of yeah. stuff so like yeah that that project which I thought was just my own whim I made like a little book out of it um, similar to the one I showed you when I first came to Maker Station uh-huh. and um, that got me my job like I showed them that and they're like cool well, well they hired me off of that so like that's great that that like kind of commercial field is one of the one of the ways um but, another one is so no, so but i want to ask yeah. like specifically around purses or bags oh yeah no like i kind of abandoned that specific topic but i think so you i think can there's you, some worth there oh i think there's definitely something there if you can connect you know if, if the stars align and even i was thinking just now because i'm looking at it again while we're talking is like you should do one for rock rock climbers like what's in the rock climbers bag like you could do portraits because because rock climbing involves pretty cool backpacks <laughs> right as you can imagine you go to rei they got a whole two different departments with backpacks in them right for whatever style you want and um so you always got to be hauling gear um and then there's also in rock climbing we use chalk bags to hold our chalk which are also very personalized quite a bit um, which I think there's potentially something cool there that you could do. Um, not artistically as a project, I think would be cool, but also potentially like partner with some kind of brand or as a campaign, you know, like a, like a marketing campaign that's not to diminish the artistic side, right? But that that brings a little bit more something artistic and unique to a more mundane topic like marketing. Yeah, and just an idea. Just yeah, and on that note, like you, that's like encouraging. And then uh-huh. I, I like think about how I would execute it. And one of the kind of funny things that you don't consciously think about was that like uh, I did that project because I had access to all these young women, like as uh-huh. a young man, and that like now being an older man, like I couldn't do that project. And if sure. I if I could do it, it would have to be like way way different approach, right? Like right. I'd have to like find like an intermediary, <laughs> or sure. like so like that's part of the interesting uh, process is that like now like you said like maybe it would be like doing it through a company or an like agency, it would be right? yeah or an agency, <laughs> but like at the time it was just kind of like basically talking to strangers and saying like hey can I draw you, <laughs> nice. which which is like. Like, when you see a finished product, sometimes it's, like, impossible to know all the crazy little things that go into the process, uh-huh. right? Stuff that's, like, completely seems like should be the easy part ends up being, like, the hardest part. And that's a probably a good parallel to, like, you you saying about, like, you want to paint this spoil board. The, the 90% of, like, the obstacle at the moment is physically getting it so you can manipulate it. Right. Um, and then, like, the actual art part is, like, technically easier. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, I think, like, the first nut I should, I need to crack is think about, like, how do I get meaningful, useful, easy access? So, like, maybe that's relying on friendships. And you could, like, yeah. say, like, hey, my friend Sean does this bag thing. You interested? And Yeah, yeah, exactly. We can, we talk, we should talk about this offline a little bit, but I'll just queue it up to set the seed of, uh. So now, because I'm making hang boards, I'm having to change my perspective a little bit, right, on how I view. Now I'm trying to make a product, so there's a marketing component and in, in trying to interact with other brands and the brand building and all this and that. Um, and because rock climbing is still a very small niche sport, um, uh, there's a lot of, like, small independent, uh, like, sales people that, you know, they're contractors to the bigger brands. Um and, um, there, we may be able to, like, I would just say that I'm shocked. I'm still shocked to this day, kind of how vibrant the climbing community is in Atlanta and the Southeast in general, I guess the amount of world-class climbing kind of very close to Atlanta is, is pretty amazing. So 
there's, I think you could, I could introduce you, you like you just come hang out with us while we're climbing and you come to observe, right. And draw and paint or take, take field notes or whatever. Right. And, and, and be able to do that and, and have a good time while you're doing that. Um, relatively accessibly, more accessible than I think than you might know, right. Coming in as an outsider. So we'll talk about that some more. Yeah. And, um, um I was going to say, uh, unless we have more on that topic, I was going to move on to. No, um, I got one. I okay, got yeah, yeah. No, yeah, 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 please. <laughs> because scrolling through your what's in my bag, I just can't help. But the other at the bottom, there's a couple thumbnails on more projects from Sean, right? So there's the PDA, which I think you've talked about, and then the one next to it though is the kite project. So I just want to set the seed for a future episode. I want to talk about this. Because the first thing I thought when I saw these pictures was it was only five or seven years ago that I ever became aware of or, or learned about the phrase of like, um, that's your cross to bear thing, right? I don't know. That's like, a, I don't know if that's like a Catholic or Christian sort of expression. Um, and when I see these pictures of you crawling around this big canvas thing, I'm like, is this Sean's cross to bear? Is that what's going on here? So I'll ask that. I'll ask that now, but let's talk about it at a future episode. Okay. Um, well, just to – so it's not a complete mystery. Yeah, like that was a project where I had constructed a, a kite on a painting, and then I carried that painting from my gallery to the – or sh- excuse me, from my studio to the gallery, like the six miles, whoever it was. <laughs> and I had a, a photographer document that delivery. <laughs> Awesome. So, yeah, we can definitely get into that in the future, there's, especially um, if there's interest. <laughs> yes. There's a guy in Kennesaw. I haven't seen him in a while. Big, fit guy, runs a lot. And every once in a while, he'd bust out a giant cross and drag it around town a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's quite surreal. <laughs> right, right. To me, especially. Uh-huh. <laughs> but this, it sort of evoked a little bit of that when I, when I saw these pics. Pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to hear more about it in the cool, future. Cool, cool. All right, so Next. number Next. 32 was Carl Michael Belmont and laser cut stencils. Belmont. So I figured <laughs> out the punchline after the next day while yeah. eating cereal or drinking coffee or whatever. That, that, I like that episode because I think uh, – did Brett join us on this one? No. But that was one where I just felt so – again, so stretched thin. Sometimes I come and record these episodes. I'm, I'm just running on fumes. So that Carl Michael Belmont just, I was so blank. Like, I didn't know what to say or react or like, is this funny or not? Like, am I dumb for not getting this or is this just really flat? Um, but Carl, I guess just a little recap, right? Maybe you tell Carl Michael Belmont was in, in another old 18th century poet, right? That, um, huge influence in Sweden and actually, I guess, beyond Sweden. More than uh, and again, someone I'd never heard of. Which again, why I like these shows is they introduce me to a lot of cool uh, historical figures. Um, but that Belmont joke about, it, I guess the modern meme equivalent of it is he's essentially he's like he's so extra, right? Yeah, like he's just extra. <laughs> and so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so like uh, t- two things. One is that t- so he was basically the Bob Dylan of the Mozart era. Um, he wrote like folk songs and then like one of his surviving legacies is that there's like a Belmont joke on par with a blonde joke. Like that, that's their no, version. I don't think this is, this is where I was thinking. I don't think it's a blonde joke. I think it's like the extra <laughs> joke. It's like not even a joke. It's like a meme, like the extra meme. Sure. Yeah. Well, I guess just like the structure of like yeah. uh, three guys, a blank, a blank and a blank. And then in the third spot, like if if you're gonna like you know like how a song has the chorus and then the refrain and the chord progression right like the just the structure of it is like poetically similar to the blonde joke because it's, it's like, a blonde joke yeah. but, but but the punchline the emphasis, is it's not yeah. that he's dumb it's that he's extra yeah that's the important part is that right. it's and I was saying the reason why it blew my mind was that everywhere else in the world is content to just make fun of a Pollock or a blonde or an Irishman. Yeah, depre- yeah, and, demeaning. It's but, like a demeaning. Yeah. But Sweden, living up to their, like, isolated nature, <laughs> like, the joke isn't that he's an idiot or anything. It's, it's just extra. that he's extra. Like, he just Absolutely. destroys the expectation. 
So he, so he could smell, he could be really good at writing, he could be whatever right. the situation calls for. Well, just yes, so a little for, for re- people in the future who don't know what extra means, could you do give it like an example of someone oh, being yeah, extra? Yes. So this is exactly why I'm cracking up about it now, right? Is because I've got teenagers living in my house that um, subsist literally off memes, right? I, that, it's I like memes as much as anybody, but the younger generation literally, I think, just their whole worldview is completely shaped by, influenced, and this ongoing consumption of memes. And um, I don't know. I think it was this year, definitely within the last year, I'll be yelling at my kid to do something or whatever, trying to get him to, to help me or do something. And he literally is like, Dad, you're so freaking extra, right? And he says it in a in a way that's probably a little funnier than the way I just said it now. And my response originally was like, hell yeah, I'm extra. Like, I don't care whatever you're, you know, just do whatever I'm telling you to do. Um, and we're doing it. Um or even things like I'm trying to get him to take lunch to school and have a sandwich and a little bit of fruit and not just like a bag of chips, right? And his response is like, dang, dad, you're so extra, right? That I'm forcing him to try to have a healthy meal. Uh, and then that was going on for a couple of weeks or whatever. And then my wife one day kind of sheepishly, it's just her and I, it's like, do you know the kids, the kids have been calling you extra? And I'm like, yep, you know, kind of giggling about it. And then she looks at me and she's like, did they ever say that about me? And she was, you know, like a little bit, uh, like taken, taken aback, right? That, that the kids weren't describing her in that same way. And I kind of chuckled and I was like, I don't think I've heard them actually say that about you. And she didn't like that response. And I, at that point in time, I still didn't really understand that, that from the kid's perspective, like being extra is not, not cool. Like that's not good, right? That's kind of a, not a good thing. Uh, and I found that out later on, and my kid, I don't know if it was my son or my daughter, just like, no, Dad, no, you don't want to be extra. <laughs> like, that's not good. Where I was kind of wearing it as a, a little bit of a, a badge of honor right. for a little bit. And, but, I, and um, I always try to think of it, like, to try to put a context on it from a broad perspective. So I think back, too, to, like, we were obviously too young to be a part of it, but do you remember, like, the stereotype of the beatnik? A little bit. So, like, the picture like hate ashbury people mm-hmm. like sitting in college towns wearing bla- all black with their you know, um, like coffee and cigarettes coffee, yeah turtlenecks like the bongo. yeah yeah so this was like a counterculture thing that was like in competition right before like the hippie movement mm. so like uh you know in a post like normal <laughs> industrial mentality as soon as we have freedom what do you do with it and the, the the debate is that like that you're so unperturbed by the by the man and by the world and you're you're just like so you're so chill and like unbothered basically so like the if we could think of the antithesis of extra it's unbothered right okay so it's like a hurricane could go like by and it wouldn't yeah it wouldn't move your hair so like <laughs> it was ripe for ridicule just like the concept of extra is that it's just yeah. like whatever everyone else is you want to be the opposite and it doesn't even matter what like your actual <laughs> mentality is it's like a fad or a fashion mm-hmm. because you know it it's it's like you were saying like it could be good to be extra <laughs> which is like well it is i think so square I saw, but i saw a friend of mine i Loose, like very, just more of an acquaintance, but she's a local artist here in Atlanta. Um, she works these days in media, I think. I followed her quite a bit uh, online. And and uh, Tamara Comstock, I'm not sure what her Instagram account name is anymore, but um, kind of crossed paths with her through the maker movement. She, she used to be out in Gwinnett. And um, kind of the first time that term extra bubbled up to me was she found some old picture of her in high school it was like the prom or whatever. I don't think it was prom, but some dance school photo. And she's like really dressed up like a bedazzled jacket. And she's wearing roller skates and, and she just looks ridiculous. And she posted it self-deprecating. And she's like, God, look, guys, like look at this ridiculous picture of me. You know, I've always been this extra or something like that. Um, and it was like, yeah. And, and she's she's not a prolific artist like in the sense of like super successful, but like she – she creates a lot of art. She shares it a lot. She's very passionate about 
what she's doing um, and looks generally positive most of the time. Um, so I, I kind of had this positive connotation where like, yeah, you're just doing things that that you want to do no matter what anybody else says, right? And you're taking it to as far as the limit as you're, you're willing to do that. It's kind of the way I described extra. And I think when people are making fun of it, it's like, God, look at this person geeking out on like the one thing that they're into that nobody else cares about. Right. Right. Essentially. Yeah. And related to like embracing your extraness, um, I was relating it in my head to like the concepts of the, the engineer saying, I'm going to over engineer this. Like, like that there's this whole hobbyist like meme of saying like, I had to make a doggy door, so I'm going to over-engineer the F out of it and, like, yeah. make it have, like, cameras and switches and extra stuff, literally extra stuff than it needs. Absolutely. Because, like, that's my pleasure is, like, taking it, like, eight steps farther than anyone else logically should because that's fun to me. For sure. More power. <laughs> right. Um, and, like, that's pretty, like... Uh, I don't sound patronizing to call it cute, but it's funny to think of your wife like wishing she was extra because it's like an insult. But like, I want to be bad or something. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. It was super cute, super sweet. I thought it was really sweet. And that'll um, be a good um, connection to the next one, which was Brendan Behan and painting with digital photography, because that whole Brendan Behan poem. It's short enough that I could quote it. Never throw stones at your mother. You'll be sorry for when she's dead. Never throw stones at your mother. Throw bricks at your father's instead. So, like, they literally, like, you lived that, right? With the whole extra thing. Like, they threw, yeah. they threw the extra stone at you, and, your, and the mother was actually jealous. Yeah. I guess so, right? A little bit. I think she just saw it as, like, an attention thing, right? Uh and that's one thing I think kids have a problem with, like, in general, a little bit of taking your mother for granted a little bit, right? Maybe she may have seen it that way a little, where they where they don't express, um, you know, the work that she does and the amount of effort she puts into them um, in a way. But, um, but, yeah, I love that poem. It's, it's so good. Well, like, they say that every portrait is a portrait of the artist, not of the subject, like, that's like that there's so much of them in it like that you see their perspective what they like you know the mm-hmm. things that they care to capture and so that's kind of an interesting the thing that's been emerging that and, and the things you pick the topics you pick that mm-hmm. you're kind of telling this portrait of yourself as a father like that seems to be and husband I guess to a degree so like yeah, and the son, Brandon Bean right? thing in general like that that kind of felt like out of left field for me, but like for you, I guess it, it just like really hit home and evoked something. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I mean, I'm getting older now, and I've got kids, so like I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a son to my parents. My parents are getting older; they're both retired. So I've had you know changing dynamic with them as well, and I think there's definitely been times when I haven't been a good son to them and, and my dad's having health problems now. Um, and that's been an interesting dynamic. I'm super, they live in Arizona. I'm here in the Atlanta area. So big, big physical gap. It's hard. <clears throat> it's hard to, um, to get out there and see them or, uh, or be there. And with my dad having health problems, he's sort of taking it like a guy to like, just, it's not as it's bad, but it's not that bad. And it's whatever, you know, sort of, just sort of brute forcing through it. And my mom's like really worried, like really worried um, about it. Um, and trying to deal with that dynamics been interesting as well. And, it, you know, I, even the way I interact with my dad and my mom is different, kind of reflected in this, this poem as well, um, as well as the way we interact here on a daily basis at home with my more immediate family. For sure. And um, just to touch on the photography side or painting for digital photography, um, I think you kind of brought up an interesting thing with saying that you looked at my original portfolio Uh and how, like, I kind of think of that as, like, dead and gone. And then because of, like, the way the Internet is, like, it's as available and fresh as anything else. Like, it's on equal terms. Like... 
Absolutely. If, if you built a storefront in 1980 and didn't bother upkeeping it, and you came back to it, it would be destroyed, right? Yeah, decrepit, but, right? But like the way digital photography and the internet is, it's like I put those images up, and now they're equally pristine and accessible and on equal footing, maybe even competing with the stuff that I did yesterday. So yeah, I think as fun. long as that server doesn't get upgraded <laughs> <laughs> and lost in some way, then yeah, it's there. Or uh, so, yeah, it's just pretty amazing. That's that's quite awesome. And yeah, you might be able to uh, either resurrect it or not resurrect it. Use it as a, a building block, even today, right, in a, in a fresh way. And it's pretty cool. And the, let's talk about that flip side. So you were jo- you were joking about like the MySpace migration, how they lost all this data, right? Mm-hmm. But the flip side of that is that um, the natural thing is for data to be lost and decay. So, mm-hmm. um, like, if you take pictures, like, you take pictures and then you lose them, right? Like, that's just yep. natural. You kind of lose keep with them. Maybe you forget a password. Maybe you forget where they you kept them. And then you might stumble across them one day while you're cleaning and you you blow on them. And you're like, oh, yeah, I remember this. Yeah, right. Hey. But for when you <laughs> you outsource, outsource that to the cloud... I you know I I stopped thinking about those images and that server kept on chugging along. <laughs> <laughs> it did. <laughs> like I I wouldn't even know how to like access the back end anymore. I'd have to like ask the server for a password reset. But wow. but yeah. it still works from a viewer side, which is for sure a cool thing. Absolutely, I think it's cool. I will say the other thing out of the painting from digital photography that. It was actually quite helpful to me and encouraging was just hearing your take on how you use that process because it's something that I was actually using, I think, in a more rudimentary way myself and didn't feel comfortable talking about it or felt like cheating in some way, right, that using a digital photography as a starting point to build creative work on top of it um, was, was quite insightful for me. And just let me get over any hangups I might have had about about doing something like that. Yeah, and just and to, kind of, that. to keep <clears throat> hammering home on that, um, it's it's easy to forget how violent transition and translation can be, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so I had this really pivotal moment when I was a kid, and I was watching like whatever was on AMC because that's what was on TV, and it was like Sinbad the Sailor. But mm. it it was from, like, the golden era of MGM, and so it was, like, this red-headed Irish guy playing Sinbad the Sailor on a MGM lot produced by, like, Jewish immigrants. And by the time mm. you add everything to that soup, it's a whole new thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's so far removed from the original, like, 40 Thieves book written in the Middle East, right? Like, it's, like, almost yeah. an entirely different animal unrecognizable from the start. And um, so, like, just, you know, uh, not to say that it it's automatically so translated or so different, but, you know, try to do something on purpose and make it as faithful as you can and a million different little imperfections and changes happen automatically, right? Sure. So imagine yeah. how much more when you try to <laughs> be transformative. Absolutely. Very cool. So next on our topics are a rhetoric of irony and hangboards revisited, and we had Brett for the first time. This is the first episode with Brett. Mm-hmm. And cool. And the funny thing was that he just was along for the ride. We didn't even <laughs> ask him about his stuff at all. No, we did it. Yeah, we forgot. Um, now this was cool. So um, I don't think we need to touch on hangboards too much, other than the the cold intro where you introduced the. I don't know what this is, the little um, parable about much can happen between the lip and the cup is um, something that stuck with me ever since then relative to the hangboards because every time – I've sold two hangboards to go get money and, and actually got, sold them and gotten money, but I had to meet the person you know, uh, face-to-face to deliver the product, and then they would give me uh, the cash. So some – actually both – transactions ended up getting delayed and pushed off and this and that, right? It took about a week or two to actually get through it. 
So I kept having to think like, I haven't actually sold this yet, <laughs> right? Even though in my mind, I'm starting to count, sort of count your chickens before they hatch type of mentality. And I think that was, it's very much a not, like a more poetic way to say that same, you know, that same expression, right? Don't count your chickens before they hatch, which I thought was really cool. And in terms of the irony thing, like um, talking about it kind of, awakened it in a different way like when you when you just read you're kind of passive about it but then when you try to quote unquote teach it to someone else it kind of it activates you in a different way yeah and so um just talking about the concept of this guy's take on irony and how it's a like to stop thinking of it as this about someone being mean or sarcastic and start thinking about it as sharing um it's it's been really useful like for lack of a better word. So like the, that extra thing is a perfect example where it's like, it's not about your kids like owning you and, and making you feel stupid. It's like, (laughs) it's like the fact that you're both realize that this term extra is kind of silly and funny. And you're both like kind of participating in it is like, it's like, it's such a, 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 a more productive way to think about irony. I think, Especially because you were saying that, like, memes are the lifeblood of teens these days. It's like, yeah. the easiest thing to do in the world is to dismiss, like, a younger generation as being, like, stupid or, it, like, not getting it. But really, it's a matter of, like, um, you know, opening yourself up to understanding oh, yeah. that language, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things I really enjoy about being a young dad, like relatively young dad. I had my kids in my early twenties, early to mid twenties. So I'm definitely one of the younger dads around now and interact with, with some other parents. And I feel like I'm just even, even five years closer to me remembering what it was like to be a teenager. Right. Than some of my, uh, my friends and acquaintances that I know that have kids that are just a little bit further removed from that. Um, I think it makes a big difference. Um, and I can tell you though, my son, he, when he calls me extra, it, he's he's having fun with it, but he, he definitely does not mean it in a positive way. All right, it's like a safe way for him to to whine and grope and uh, gripe about whatever it is that I'm being extra about that he's not 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 happy with, um, which is pretty yeah, which is pretty cool. I'm the one that tries to have fun with it and just be like, you better believe it, Suddy. Um, but the rhetoric thing, I think that was one too. Brett was on because I do remember like that was so far out, kind of intellectually, they just didn't quite know where to go with it, or it's very hard to process like that new, new information and new level at a very intellectual level. I think on the fly while we're being recorded, uh, that was that was challenging, which I think was cool though. I, I, it's okay to be challenged like that. I think we managed to pull through it okay. But again, I spent a lot of time in my car commuting. So I think at some point in my car, you know, these things are spinning in the back of your head and it started to click about the irony thing and, and not necessarily related to my life. Like I know a lot of the, the comedy that I like to watch in movies and TV shows, which to me, I guess a good example is Arrested Development from 10 years ago. Um, but even other like Arrested Development and um, was it? The Larry, Larry David show, what was that called? Curb Your Enthusiasm and even Seinfeld somewhat. Those are all, I used to describe them as absurd because I didn't have a better way to describe them. But I think they were fall more into the line of this rhetoric of irony that, that you and, and Wayne Booth were describing. Would you agree like those, would you describe those shows as falling into like a, a better example of, of building on that that work that Booth describes or is, am I out of left field coming out of left field? Or no, yeah, you're right. First of all, yeah, that like absurd has now been reappropriated as being, being like, this is the cool kind of comedy, right? Like that, like or it's intelligent. Been, yeah. yeah it's, like, it's kind of like an intelligent comedy. Thing. Like why is Rick and Morty fun? And it's like, it, you call it like absurd, but you know, what really is, it's like you're, it's capturing something that you recognize but it's not the usual stuff. It's like, it's like, so yeah, like I think you're exactly right that it's like Booth was all about recognizing 
that, you know, some of the most interesting things we share are the things that you can't even express directly in words. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's like the, the, the minute. So like with the Larry David example is that it's like, you know, you, the, the foibles of you going up to the counter, wanting to buy something, them not treating you with respect or whatever, you know, it's like the little bit of the micro interactions, the micro relationships, that's where like the most fun happens. Cause it's like, if you have an enemy and they say, I'm going to kill you very clearly defined, right? <laughs> very clearly defined what I should do, what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. All the motivations are very explicit, but 99.9% of all human reactions are hiding your explicit Emotions, emotions right. yeah. So, like, that's why that it becomes so important to understand how we process that, or why we might process it that way. Cool. I, okay. So, Great. um, yeah, like, I appreciate that topic as well. It's been pretty fun to go through this. We we gone through five of them and got an hour. Got an in. hour, should, yeah. I think we're we, good. Should we uh, maybe save the next five for the next episode? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Or uh, it don't even have to be five in a sequential order, right? We could uh, potentially cherry pick a couple. And if if anyone, if any of our of our handful of listeners out there uh, want to suggest some episodes they want to see some follow ups on, or have a question about something in the past, like leave us a comment. Yeah, and as a kind of like yeah. final thought, I had this pitch for you that I thought we we could investigate, which was that we might solicit a topic from our pool of friends or listeners. Sure. So, like, instead of the what I fixed, we could have, like, if Brett said, I want you to talk about this, we could try that the next episode. Absolutely. That would be cool. Cool. So, um, I'll, uh, I have to figure out what I'm going to do about the show links, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll repost all (laughs) the ones we mentioned and people can check it out. That might be good. Absolutely. Great. All right. Well, this was fun. And, uh, Definitely, it's great to hit a milestone with number 40 here. Talk to you next time. Okay, bye-bye.